Welcome back to Material Atomics. I'm really sorry it's been a while since we've made a video, but we are working on a book that is going to cover a lot of the information we've learned over the course of making these videos. We are also preparing a conference. That's right. We are also teaching two courses. We are also putting together a museum exhibit on contact with the extraterrestrial. And we got two podcasts coming out every week at our other channel, the Demystify Sci Podcast. Which is not to say that we're busy, but we're kind of busy. We're a little bit busy. Everybody's busy. I get it. Look, we have been working on material atomics. It's mostly going into this book right now. And, you know, when we were starting off writing this book, we had to wrestle with our model of light. And so the last video that we put out really, I think, clarified our model of light in terms of how we understand the material basis of how one atom talks to another atom using a mechanical <laughs> we're sitting down to write this book about the filamentary model of light and gravity we had to really wrestle with the mechanics of how it was that light was causing other atoms to resonate or not resonate and this led us to our antenna model of light so today we want to talk about polarization because that's an extension of the antenna model of light. And the really cool kicker at the end of this video is that we're revisiting the three polarizer paradox, which is a very spooky effect, which you can see on screen here, where if you actually put two polarizers at 90 degrees, you block all of the light and you insert a third at 45 degrees, you get more light appearing, which is very counterintuitive if you're going by the standard explanation that each one of these polarizers is screening out you know the light which is appropriate to its orientation it just doesn't make sense so we think that our antenna model of light can solve this problem and we're really excited to share it with you but before we get there it's worth doing a little bit of a refresher on what we mean by the antenna model of light because it has been a hot second since anyone has thought about this except for us that's absolutely right so let's talk really quickly about what is going on during the transmission of light here's an atom well it's a representation of an atom. Let's say a hydrogen. It's more or less spherical, and we understand that the outer surface of the atom is the electron shell. Now, electrons have this strange property called spin one half, which has to do with their momentum. That is the way that this surface is turning in our interpretation. Now, we know that the way it turns is described by this concept of spin one half, which you can check out this video about to get a better grip on it. But an important part of spin one half is that the electron is rotating. And that as it's rotating, you see that the magnetic component of that rotation is along the equatorial direction. And the electric component points towards the pole of that rotation. If you look at the black arrows here, and I rotate it in the direction of the black arrows, I'm rotating it along the magnetic field here. And naturally, the electric field points up. Likewise, if I rotate it the opposite direction, now the magnetic field has reversed and the electric field has to follow. These are the arrows in green. So as I rotate this atom back and forth, I change the direction of the electric field. This is called the direction of the polarity of the electric field. So it's polarized up in one direction and polarized down. This is essentially what antennas do, except antennas are big chains of, of these atoms that are grouped end on end. So if we line up a bunch of these atoms end on end, what we do is we can get to a place where we can put an alternating current into that wire such that the atoms are all lockstep rotating back and forth. Their shells are rotating back and forth. And this is how we set up a standing wave in that antenna. So just to recap on our model of light, what is happening during light is that the filament which connects the energizing source, the other atom in the light bulb, let's say, with this atom which is getting illuminated, is that the filament is actually swinging this atom back and forth. There's actually a tensile force inside the filament which is yanking it back and forth like this. And that's important for how light is transmitted. So now that we understand polarization, which is the direction of polarity here, 
Let's think about how polarizers work. The conventional explanation of a polarizer that all of us probably vaguely remember from high school or intro physics in college is that polarizers act by blocking some portion of the light and by allowing a different portion of the light to pass through. And so if we're thinking about the electrical field, then a wire grid polarizer would allow the E field that is perpendicular to the polarizer to pass through, and that is how it produces linearly polarized light. When you place another polarizer that's at 90 degrees to it, that polarizer is unable to pass any of the light because it can only pass light that is perpendicular to its axis of wires, and therefore you get no light that has passed between two 90-degree polarizers. And as long as you're working with two polarizers, this explanation is perfectly fine because it doesn't totally really matter the specifics of what gets transmitted or what gets absorbed or what gets reflected. The point is, is that at the end of the day, if you have two polarizers at 90 degrees to one another, you're not going to get any light that passes through them. And as you rotate one polarizer relative to the other, you start to get light. Things get really weird when you add a third polarizer that goes in between these two polarizers at 90 degrees and you put it in at 45 degrees. At 45 degrees, the polarizer appears to produce more light than exists between the two polarizers because all of a sudden you start to get more transmission of light than you did at 90 degrees. And so if the conventional explanation about screening and permitting is the correct explanation, it doesn't really make any sense that you could put in a polarizer and have it be at 45 degrees and suddenly produce more light than was there to begin with. In order to really get to the bottom of the three polarizer paradox, we have to bring in this antenna model of light in order to think about what's happening. And so think of the first polarizer. You have unpolarized light that is moving towards it. And all of the light hits the wire grid, but only the light that is directly aligned with that antenna that is inside the wire grid polarizer, that up and down motion of the electric field, is able to resonate with the incident light. And so each wire inside the polarizer resonates with the incident light. And so their E fields are going up and down, which means that their magnetic fields, based off of what Shiloh said earlier, are going to be going left to right. And so you have this perpendicular E field, perpendicular M field. Okay. And so the conventional explanation is that the polarizer will only transmit the light that is perpendicular to the wire grid polarizer. And this is a little bit heretical, but we think that that might not be correct. We think that what might be happening is that the polarizer is actually acting as an antenna that absorbs light that is whose E field is parallel with the wire grid and then re-emits that light in an active process. And so when you just have two polarizers, it hits the next polarizer. And because those antennas are perpendicular to the direction of the E field, there's no resonance that happens there. And so you get no re-emission and you get darkness. But When you add this 45-degree polarizer in between them, the vertical E field hits the polarizer that's at 45 degrees and causes a little bit of resonance. It can't transmit all of its resonance because the polarizer is at 45 degrees, not perfectly aligned, but it does get that antenna moving a little bit. And that antenna then re-emits 45-degree light. That 45-degree light can get to the third polarizer and excite it and allows you to detect light on the far side. And so if you can think of light as this active process of absorption and emission from atoms, and if you can think of the wire grid polarizer as an antenna that is transmitting light and absorbing light and emitting light, then you no longer have a three polarizer paradox. You just have that when you have three polarizers, you have a slightly different condition than when you have two polarizers, but it's not particularly perplexing. 
I think that the real take home here is that polarizers are active devices. They're they're literally antennas that absorb and re-emit, but they only re-emit along a certain axis. And that means that they're only capable of interacting with other antennas that are properly aligned to them. And so the alignment of each one of these polarizers with respect to each other is fundamentally just an antenna process. And, and antennas have to be aligned properly in order to transmit and receive. We know this. And so these polarizers are active materials. They're not just passive filters like you learned in high school. That's the key. And whenever you see a paradox in physics, it means something hasn't been understood or there's been a giant mistake made at some point. And we think that this is what that is. So let us know your thoughts. Again, consider coming out to our conference next April to coincide with the total solar eclipse in Austin, Texas on the weekend of the 7th and 8th. And we will be back with more interrogations of the material atomic world soon. And we'll be waterboarding atoms.